Who defiled the temple? Many of you are familiar with the story of the books of Maccabees. Notice these books were not kept as scripture by the Levite temple priests in Qumran. And there's a reason. If you haven't watched our original canon series or read the Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar, we released a few months ago that one. Uh, You may not be aware, but we prove that completely. So go check that out. And no, we're not going to debate anybody on this video. Our channel, our rules. So if you're going to try to head there without reviewing the case, you're just going to be muted. So don't do it. Why wouldn't they keep Maccabees as scripture? The reason? The community in Qumran, really the biblical Bethabara, where John the Baptist lived and operated as he was a son of Aaron, a son of Zadok, a Levite, basically qualified to be a temple priest. This is where he lived and operated, even baptizing Messiah there. Now, he condemned, and they condemned, and flat out rebuked the Hasmoneans or Maccabees as the sons of darkness, the wicked priest, those who seek smooth things. That's not a compliment. Or smooth words, in other words, liars. And spouter of lies, very direct, who took over the temple and conquered Yehudia. There are many such records in that community which are swept under the carpet no longer. Yeah, they're published, yes, but with the most illiterate of interpretations trying to handcuff and keep everyone in that false paradigm. They're attempting to separate these as different factions and, oh, well, the wicked priests, that's only one Hasmonean, not all of them. It can only be one, yet all of them served, you know, after him as the king and priest and being the high priest of the temple. Duh, it's really not hard to figure out if one actually can think. These people don't seem to be able to. Now, We're told in Maccabees, and let's be clear, the Greeks were very good at recording history, and they do not record this story. It only originates in Maccabees, and from Pharisee historians, such as Josephus, who is an admitted Pharisee, Hasmonean, or Maccabee, by blood even, and he, as seen trained in Ein Gedi. Now, this video will correct this for good. Because the Maccabees story is a lie. And we'll prove it. Now, when you look at the historic writings of the Aaronic Temple priests, who were the keepers of scripture exiled to Qumran, Bethabara, now, you get the full story. And theirs is a true history. Let's get right to it. This is what they say, and the Pharisees in Catholic Church have ignored and explained away in willing ignorance, just as Peter warned us they would do. It's time to resolve the doctrines of men. Oh, this one's going to hit hard, so buckle up and enjoy the ride. Within the commentaries of interpretation of scripture by these exiled temple priests, we find the history of what actually happened to them. That they were exiled by whom and how, and their disdain for these sons of darkness who stole the temple and the practice in Yahudia. These temple priests interpret the prophecy of Nahum, for instance, as you see. To refer to, now these are their written words, someone will say, well, that's not scripture. Let's be clear. This is not a Bible book. It is history. It's a writing found in Qumran. It's ironclad, firm history dated to the first century AD and actually affirmed as such. Now, This is the other side of the story in history from the actual temple priests. And again, these were holy men who kept and taught scripture, maintaining the temple rituals in Qumran. They left us a massive library 
of Scripture and their own writings. Now, here it goes. Interpreted by the temple priests. This concerns Demetrius, king of Greece, who sought on the counsel of those who seek smooth things to enter Jerusalem. Now, who are they? We'll show you. They define this group that seeks smooth things, smooth words, or what the New Testament calls ear-tickling words, same ones. They are slick and smooth. They are deceivers. But Elohim did not permit the city to be delivered into the hands of the kings of Greece. Now, what does that mean? We'll we'll cover the history so you can see for yourself the actual written history, which tells us Greece took Yehudia, but peacefully. And there is no story of the Greeks defiling the temple, period. Now, how do we know this? Read. From the time of Antiochus, who was that? He was the ruler of that area for Greece, as were his sons, grandson, and so on, all the way to Antiochus the Fourth, known as Epiphanes. He is reported only in the book of Maccabees, and again, those that are really quoting that in origin, as defiling the temple, because it wasn't enough for Yehudia to pay their taxes and be controlled. No, he all of a sudden decided to just go and you know, against even Alexander the Great's wishes, and attack Yehudia and defile the temple because he just had to do it with uh, the sacrifice of a pig, of course. Why? Because that would bring outrage. See, propaganda does that. It brings outrage. They, they add elements that make you say, oh, how dare they, right? Well, how dare they would certainly be the case if they sacrificed a pig in the temple, but that would be pretty stupid on the part of the Greeks. Let's just call it what it is. They just wanted their taxes. Come on. Now, it seems contrived because it is an outright lie and propaganda. We'll show you, but let's keep reading. Check this out. So, Jerusalem was not conquered by any military of the Greeks, by the way. It was occupied Yes, a peaceful takeover, replacing basically Persia in tax collection. But war? No, not in that era. The temple priests now tell us the true story. This is the real story. From the time of Antiochus, and that's the first, and that would include the fourth because this is going forward, until the coming of the rulers of the Katim. Who's that? That is the Romans. The Roman Empire are the Katim in these writings many times over. We're not going to prove that in this video because we are eventually going to do a video on the Katim. And we will definitely prove it. But it is certainly an indisputable fact. And you see that even Giza Verms knows this. Katim is an ancestor of Japheth, by the way. Certainly not Shem. But then, she shall be trampled under their feet, she being Jerusalem. Whose feet? Well, one could try to inject Rome there, as they certainly would uh, happen to do so. But who's the subject of this interpretation? Who is they? They is those who seek smooth Things. The ones running the temple at that time who speak smooth things and people are deceived. And boy, do they have a lot to say about them. Yet they call them thieves, which fits what Messiah called them. They say they prey on the poor and on widows, orphans, and the like. And wow, so did Messiah, didn't he? In fact, Messiah told us they flatter with their words but their hearts are evil in different ways. He called them hypocrites all, brood of vipers, the seed of Satan, and the synagogue of Satan, and the Dead Sea Scrolls share Messiah's sediments. You can see that right there. They are the Pharisees, or modern rabbis, and Hasmonians, and they, in fact, do trample Jerusalem under their feet, and they conquer the temple exactly as predicted by David in Psalm 83, what they call the Psalm 83 
War. We have several videos on that. Go check them out in our Lost Tribes series if you haven't. And that happened in 165 BC. It's not a future event, folks. It's already happened. It was not a revolt, as it's labeled, from within Judea. That is false and fraught. The Hasmoneans came from Modain, which is in Dan, not Judah, not Judea, or Yahuda, right? They were foreigners. They were Samaritans with Philistines, Edom, etc. as their allies. Now, I'll share another passage which clearly identifies this, but let's back uh, up a little to some history here as this is accurate to history. This fragment is accurate. Maccabees, however, is not. It makes us a new history, basically, uh, in propaganda. The book is a lie and even has the Maccabees praying for the dead in the end, an unbiblical pagan practice from their origin in Persia, Media, where their religion actually originates. Without going into massive detail, as this is a video, not a lecture, so we're not going for hours here. This hopefully will be a half an hour or less. We'll choose a source which deals with multiple accounts on this from William Whiston in 1726. He's recapping the accounts of Origen, Josephus, and others. The link is on the screen, so go and read them all. We pull out Origins and a piece of Josephus to demonstrate, but really, read the whole thing. Go ahead. The Jewish nation, meaning the Yahudim, never Jews, that's not Hebrew, was so preserved by the divine power that they did not undergo any affliction. Hmm, they didn't? Well, I thought they did. No, they didn't. Even under Alexander, now that's further back, in all fairness, the Macedonian, Macedonian, that's Alexander the Great, nor by him, although they would not take up arms against Darius on account of certain leagues and oaths. Remember, Darius decreed, King Darius of Persia decreed, the rebuilding of the temple and the return of the lost tribes of the southern kingdom to Yahudea. So, they're bound to him as they actually told Alexander they were, by which they were bound to him. Then it was, they say, the high priest of the Yahudim, as he was clothed with his sacred garment, was adored by Alexander, who said that a person was seen by him in that very habit, the priestly robe, who promised in a dream to subdue, to conquer Asia, basically for him, or to him. Now, remember Daniel predicted Alexander and the rise of the Greeks? That's right there in his visions. So, this is about 300 BC, 350, 360, somewhere in there. Um, and we, we have, you know, 150 plus years uh, before the Hasmonean Revolt. But it sets the tone and confirms what we just read in the Dead Sea Scrolls, doesn't it? And we wanted to go back to the beginning of this narrative, really. And this is the beginning. This is the foot they started on, the ground, the foundation and relationship between Greece and Yahudia. Now, Greece did not conquer Jerusalem with their military, did they? It was a peaceful takeover. They just walked in, basically. In fact, the temple was open, people were all dressed in white, and the priests were all in their robes. And they welcomed them. Now, Greece did not conquer them. Now, in Josephus' account, which is much, much longer, and again, we encourage you to read it all. The same occurs, so he's agreeing with Origen here. However, he exposes the instigators of this as the Samaritans, in fact, which affirms the Dead Sea Scrolls commentary or really firm history that we just read. Now, Alexander, as in Origen's story, extended his hand in peace to the high priest. Notice the response from the Samaritans, the enemies of Yahudia, who would conquer the temple 150 plus years later. And when the Phoenicians, Samaritans, and Chaldeans, Scythians, Mm, that's interesting. 
That's very interesting. The Chaldeans are well-noted enemies of Yahudia, as are the Scythians, but odd that they would put those together. Now, the Scythians have ties to the Nephilim uh, in the land of Canaan, in fact, in history. But that's another story. That followed him. Thought they should have liberty to plunder the city and torment the high priest to death. They wanted to kill the high priest. Wow. Imagine that. Not enough to conquer the city for them. They wanted the temple. Even then, why? Well, you'll see. Which was the king's, Alexander's, displeasure fairly promised them. The very reverse of it happened. So, in other words, he said no. The Greeks did not defile the temple in the days of Alexander, nor as a matter of practice. No one says they did, so I'm not saying that. But the point is, they didn't from the beginning. Now, they had no need to sacrifice a pig on the altar even 150 plus years later. That's nonsense. It is propaganda and very easy to see through when you think about it. They take the city in peace, really, just as Persia ruled the city in peace, but it was an overarching power. This was not okay to the Samaritans who complained to the Persian king even before, and they tried to stop the temple from being built. They didn't want uh, the southern kingdom to return to Jerusalem. They didn't want it because they were already taking over the area, but it wasn't theirs. They are the real enemies here, even more than Greece, even then. And they will prove it in 150 years, of course, especially. Here is where origin story picked up. Alexander had a vision that he would take over this area. I'm going to paraphrase this because we don't have time to go through it all. And he had already seen this priest in this robe in that vision. So he did not war with them because of that. See, Greece really had no need to. But how do the Samaritans respond to his embracing the high priest and not attacking them? Whereupon the king of Syria, that's Samaria again, the replacements of the northern kingdom of Israel, who still occupied that land as the lost tribes never returned there. And the rest, that's other Samaritans essentially, their allies, were surprised at what Alexander had done and supposed him disorder in his mind. So, you crazy, yo. However, Parmenio alone went up to him and asked him how it came to pass that when all others adored him, he should adore the high priest of the Yahudim. Now, Alexander then tells him of his vision and why he would not touch this high priest nor their temple. Now, check this out. Alexander the Great then goes into the temple, and what does he do? He offers sacrifices to Yahuwah as instructed by the Levite priests. Now, we're not talking about animal. We're talking incense, essentially. Now, you know, the same ones who would be exiled to Qumran 150 years later. See, these were Hebrews. These were the temple priests, the original ones, the Levites, all the way back to Aaron. That was their bloodline, the sons of Zadok. And they're the ones exiled to Qumran, and that is what we're reading here from the Dead Sea Scrolls, their writing of history, which is the true history. These are not men of war, and they did not threaten Greece, though they had a backbone, and they would take a stand if Yahuwah had them do so. Now, Alexander, and really those following him, treated them and their temple with respect. But get this last part. They read him the book of Daniel. The prophecies in which he was prophesied and also David. Now the commentary mentions Demetrius who ruled about 294 BC a little bit after Alexander the Great. In his accounts he entered and conquered Samaria, Syria and that's the northern you know area that's not you know biblical Israel at that point uh, and it's not Yahudia. And then he went to make war with the Nabataeans, which means he skipped over Yehudia. He too did not enter Jerusalem or even Yehudia in war. According to Plutarch, and you can read his account, you can look that up, very easy to find, especially on Penelope, Chicago, uh, the university over there. This was about a decade prior to 
Antiochus, so brings into a clean timeline, easily affirmed. From Antiochus until the Romans came, Jerusalem was not delivered into the hands of the Greeks, not in military conquest. Though they made it part of their territory, yes, there's no doubting that, the Greeks respected it from Alexander forward. The forced Hellenism of the Maccabees is a false narrative and unsupported, and someone ought to bring them into accountability. Here is the succession of rulers for the Seleucid Greek dynasty within the Greek Empire for Asia Minor. They ruled Asia Minor, which included uh, Jerusalem at the time. This neck of the woods, basically. 305 to 63 BC is what you see on screen. And then the Katim, as the Dead Sea Scrolls call them, the Romans took over. And we know that. The first, Antiochus Soter, takes charge in 281 BC. And what do we know of history? Well, we just read, he and his Greek successors do not force their way into Jerusalem. They don't do it. That's what they said in their true history. Not what Maccabees says, which is a lie, written by liars according to Scripture. Messiah himself many times calls them such. Now, watch as the Aaronic temple priests in Qumran get even more specific on this, and this is so cool. Just who defiled the temple? Oh, well, here you go. This is from the commentary on Habakkuk. Again, valid, recorded history written by exiled temple priests. No, this is not scripture. It's a commentary on scripture. You've read those, right? I mean, you're watching a blog that is essentially commentary. So, yeah, I mean, we all do that, and it doesn't have to be scripture. But here's what it is. It's recorded history to the first century A.D., Wow. And it's of far greater value than any Pharisee writing, period, because they have no authority in that region, period. It's not theirs. The temple was never theirs to control. That was illegal, and Yahuwah hated it then, and he hates it now. For the violence done to Lebanon, where's Lebanon? That would be Samaria essentially. Okay, so we're talking about the Samaritans. Shall overwhelm you and the destruction of the beast shall terrify you because of the blood of men and the violence done to the land, the city and all its inhabitants. Now, what does this even mean? Well, the temple priests say this, interpret it. This saying concerns the wicked priest. Now, who is that? Even Giza Verms and many others recognize this is a reference to the Hasmoneans who took over not just as king but also priest. They took over as the high priest in the temple even. And no, it's not damning just one priest. That is just totally illiterate. I can't believe scholars even go there. It's the whole lot of them and what they stand for because they are called the sons, with an S, of darkness. Not the son of darkness, singular. They call them those, that's plural, who seek smooth things and many other things that are plural. And don't worry more on that next. We're going to deal with the smooth things so it is clear. Before we end, inasmuch as he shall be paid the reward which he himself tendered to the poor, So he attacked the poor. Nice guy. And it's not one guy. We're talking the Hasmoneans, and their priesthood is the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Sanhedrin, and the scribes. For Lebanon, that's the Samaritans. They are identifying the Hasmoneans, the wicked priests, came from where? Samaria. Well, where did the Hasmoneans come from? Samaria. It's the same. Because they are Samaritans is the council of the community in this passage, okay? And the beasts in this passage are the simple of Yehuda who keep the 
law. Who does that? The temple priests, whom they exiled to Qumran. As he himself plotted the destruction of the poor, so will Elohim condemn him to destruction. Indeed. And as for that which he said, Habakkuk further reads, Because of the blood of the city and the violence done to the land. What land? Interpreted by the temple priests. The city is Jerusalem, where the wicked priests committed abominable deeds. And, well, what did he do? Oh, wait a minute. Who defiled the temple? Here's your direct answer in history, recorded by the temple priests themselves. What did he do? Defiled the temple of Elohim. Did Greece defile the temple? No. The very breed who fraudulently control the Qumran narrative today, lying about the Dead Sea Scrolls and what is and is not scripture and who lived there, which is just the most ridiculous narrative in all of history to claim Essenes lived there when there isn't a shred of evidence saying so. I mean, I don't, it's hard to believe anybody would make themselves that stupid to say something so dumb, yet they do it and they write books on this stuff. People read them. They're the very ones who are being condemned in this writing. The Pharisees are the priest structure, along with Sadducees and scribes, Samaritan scribes. By the way, Esther's records that. Second Esther's talks about or no, actually his first answer talks about these Samaritan scribes who began calling themselves scribes. They told the, uh, you know, the, the people of Yehudia when they returned from Babylon, oh, we have the same religion. Well, you know what? They don't. Theirs is an infusion, according to 2 Kings 17, and it is not the biblical religion. And they were rejected by the southern kingdom. They did not Accept that. Now, so they are the replacements of the northern kingdom in Samaria who conquered Judea, Yehudia, and the temple in 165 BC, and they defiled the temple, not the Greeks. This is history, real documented history dated to the first century AD from the eyewitnesses themselves. Wow. Now, finally, where Habakkuk says, the violence done to the land. Now, these temple priests again tell us how to read this. These are the cities of Yehuda, where he robbed the poor of their possessions. Wow. The Hasmonean revolt, according to the temple priests who were attacked during the revolt, and that is obvious history because they're gone from the temple and replaced. How did that happen? Where did they go? Duh, I don't know. Where could it be? We have those writings in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we are ignoring them, especially the church, in willing ignorance. The Hasmonean revolt was the defiling of the temple, never the Greeks. That is what the temple priests wrote. And no Pharisee writing can overcome this, as they have no authority. None with the temple. None with Scripture. And absolutely none in the worship of Yahuwah, who is not their God. Now, a little on those who seek smooth things. Who are they? Did we identify them correctly? Let's see. In the commentaries on Isaiah, the temple priests write their interpretation as this saying, referring to the last days. Last days, folks, remember Messiah told us that the synagogue of Satan operated in Turkey, especially 2,000 years ago. He told us they lie and they infiltrate, claiming to be Yahudim, but they are not, but do lie. Revelation 2.9 and 3.9. And this well matches him calling the Pharisees the seed of Satan. Whether you take that physically or just as a metaphor, doesn't matter. The point is they follow the doctrines of, if nothing else. This group is extremely easy to track. And they have even more power in the last days, according to Messiah, and we're seeing that. Today, we call them Jews. 
They are Pharisees, generally. Not all Jews, as many have no clue and are good people. This is even about, uh, you know, things that they are not even aware of. But those at the top, they well know. Many rabbis well know. Concerns the congregation of, here's that, here's, here, here it is, those who seek smooth things in Jerusalem. Now, who controls the temple system of worship at this point? Not the Levite priests. They were exiled. They're in Qumran. And this is their ancient record found in Qumran, in their community, in their library. This is condemning the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, who are not Hebrews even, and they're the ones in control in Jerusalem who seek smooth things. Very easy. Who despise the law and do not trust in Elohim. But wait a minute. They dance around and sing Torah, Torah, Torah. They are all about Torah, aren't they? Messiah said their traditions, which are now written in what is called the Talmud, the true lens of all of their interpretation, well, they're the opposite of Torah. They are against his commandments. That's what he says in Mark 7 especially. They are the synagogue of Satan. Read on. As robbers lie in wait for a man. This is how they operate. This is why Messiah turned over the tables in the temple, as they are the money changers, the robbers, the pawnbrokers of origin, now called bankers. And they control much of the world, even governments today and militaries. They are the pirates of the Barbary Coast in history, as well as the Caribbean. Their own words say that, but so do gravestones and many other things uh, that prove this in evidence. They are the bankers exiled from over 60 countries because of their evil practices, which are documented as treason to those nations, ex excessive interest of which we pay far more today. But because they call it compounding interest, and it's a lot lower, supposedly, well, it's okay to pay 100 plus percent interest because you are on many things. They are the Jesuits exiled from over 70 countries because of their evil practices, as Ignatius Loyola, their founder, was a Murano Jew. See, they have despised the words of the law. They do not know nor represent Torah. That's what history says. That's what the temple priests say, impugning this people. Now, we could go through many such passages in the Dead Sea Scrolls along these lines because, I mean, it's a massive amount. Okay, but here's one more. These are the scoffers in Jerusalem who have despised the law of Yahuwah and scorned the word of the Holy One of Israel. Who is this? This is the congregation of scoffers in Jerusalem known as the Hasmoneans, Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, flat out and royally rebuked in these writings as the sons of darkness, which we'll do a whole video on at some point, who stole the temple and hijacked the practice. It's the same thing the Catholic Church did with Constantine. Huh? Well, he was the high priest of the Persian religion, oddly, Persian once again, called Mithraism, he was not a Catholic, not till his dying day, according to many stories, on his deathbed. There it is again, who descended from some Flavius, some Flavian, who was not actual bloodline Flavian from the Flavian emperors, no, but had their name somehow. Well, how is this? Well, Josephus was adopted into that Roman emperor family. Yet, his bloodline was, of course, never true Flavian. He was adopted. He was a Pharisee, Hasmonean, and Essene. And, oh, look, there is his descendant, Flavius Constantine. His father was Flavius Constantius, founding what we call the Catholic Church, hijacking the religion of the Bible once again and infusing it with the Persian religion of sun worship. 
Throughout its practices, you can see the Catholic Church looks nothing like the biblical ecclesia, not if you actually read it and understand it, and yet it looks very similar to Mithraism, and the Persian influences are so... So, who are those who seek smooth things, who are recorded as defiling the temple, the wicked priest? They are the Hasmoneans, the Pharisees, and the entire Sanhedrin, who were not even Hebrews in origin, but from Samaria, the sons of darkness, the temple priests called them, the replacements of the lost tribes of the northern kingdom who had been playing religion since 2 Kings 17 recorded it, which says they infused worship of Yahuwah, Y-H-W-H, with their gods, such as Ashima, who Judaism continues to worship to this day. They call him Hashem, same etymology. And Molech, otherwise known as Baal or Baal, which is Hebrew for the English word Lord, which was used to replace the actual name of YHWH, Yahuwah, over 6,800 times in the Old Testament in utter fraud. And these scholars defend this ridiculous action. Perhaps some mixed in, in blood, such as in Paul's case. His parents, his father, likely a Pharisee, mother from the tribe of Benjamin. And yes, some Pharisees were even saved in Messiah's ministry, so not all were evil. Don't go there. Don't accept anyone who tells you that kind of stuff. But the system and leadership most certainly was and remains so today, as it is called Rabbinic Judaism, since the Second Temple was destroyed, according to the Jewish Encyclopedia even, which tells us these are the same. The only difference is the Second Temple was destroyed and they took those rituals out. Phariseeism became modern Rabbinic Judaism. Pretty much the same thing. Yeah, they leaven it, they add to it, because that's what they do to everything according to Messiah many times. Remember, too, Ezra rebuked many in Yahudia when they returned from Babylon because they had taken especially Samaritan foreign wives. Now, they sent those wives away because they were not Hebrews. If they were Hebrews, it would not have been against the law. And we will get to Hanukkah soon as well because that is not a biblical holiday. We'll show you. The Samaritans tried to get Alexander to conquer Judea, Yahudia, and they were upset that they could not ransack it, and Alexander stopped them. See, they were building their own temple at the time, even according to the account that Josephus wrote. They infused their worship, their false worship. They infused Yahuwah into their worship of their gods, and they did it at Mount Gerizim. You'll hear quite a bit of scuttle about this. Mount Gerizim is the real holy mountain. That's the real temple. No, it's not. That is Pharisee nonsense. That is Samaritan nonsense. Never, ever is that the temple. And in this exact account, this is when they were building that temple. Same time, according to Josephus. A Pharisee temple, and Yahuwah rejected it, and he still does. They remained very jealous of Yahudia, and they wanted it, and its temple, and they took it in time, fulfilling Psalm 83, already fulfilled. This is history. Maccabees is not. It is not scripture. It is not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but outright rebuked as a lie, and now you have it all. We hope you have learned something from this video resolving yet another doctrine of men. Yah bless to everyone.